So it's good to have the Goins family with us this morning. I believe they're going to bring us a special, and then he's going to preach to us. God bless you. Well, good morning. I don't know when the last time I was in this church or not, Jack. I don't know if I remember. Um, did Dwayne Johnson, did he pastor down here or was it somewhere close to here? He never did? Okay, not this church you're saying. Yeah, okay. And where was the old church located? Okay. That probably was the last time I was down here for, you know, for any kind of a service. Um, anyway, but it's good to see you all. Uh, some of you I've known for years, and some of you, uh, it's good to see you for the first time. So... Um, is everything in your world the way you want it to be? When you think about the future, Max, uh, are you uh, 
very, very secure in what's going to happen to your children, your grandchildren? You feel good about that? Uh, it's an uncertain time, isn't it? And uh, so God help us to look to the source of our security. That's kind of the theme that's maybe on my mind, and we'll see how it plays out. I can remember a few years ago, I was hauling, I had hauled a piece of equipment for rental. I worked for Woods Lumber there at Independence, and uh, I'd hauled a piece of rental equipment somewhere over towards Elk City. Some of you know where that's at. And was headed back, listening to the radio, the Supreme Court had just uh, ruled on that marriage bill, marriage case, and ruled in favor of homosexual marriage. President Obama was in the White House, and you all remember what he did? He lit the White House up with rainbow colors. And uh, I remember thinking, just kind of praying and thinking, you know, uh, it just seems like that iniquity and evil is just was multiplying. Now, that's several years ago. And uh, I had been reading in Revelation, the book of Revelation. And uh, along in there, for after John, or uh, yeah, John the Revelator, writes those, Jesus gives him that information for the seven churches and all that in chapters four and five. The scene opens up in heaven and uh, the angels and the cherubims and the creatures, whoever they all are, are, are glorifying God and, you know, it's a tremendous scene. But that's heaven and this is here. <laughs> this is reality for us, right? Uh, but then that scene opens to maybe in chapter 5 where the book, the scroll is displayed to the heavenly host there. And there's weeping. John's weeping. Because he, he don't want, nobody can open this scroll. Commentators think that probably that has to do with uh, the title deed to the earth, who's going to control the earth, and it's sealed with seven seals. And uh, John is in great distress over this. He re realizes the gravity of the situation. And so uh, this angel comes to John, and he says, don't weep. And then the Son of God, the Lamb, the slain Lamb, who is also the glorified Christ and King, comes. And he takes the book, and this angel tells John, he says, John, weep not. Don't weep for this. Because he has the authority to take care of this scroll. And it dawned on me in a new way. That's the time we're probably living in right now, is this scroll that has to do with the events that are going to happen on our earth right here and now, that are happening right here and now. And it's not, it's not a battle of evil versus good and who's going to win. That's not where it's at. There are certain events that have to take place. Now, I don't know why they all have to take place. <laughs> I'd bypass some of it, I guarantee you. But um, as Jesus Christ takes and pops the seals and all those events of Revelation pour out, some of them I think probably we're in the middle of. I don't know. I'm not a, a prophet. But as they happen, 
I realized that he is the one that's in charge. Who has control of the book? He does. Who popped the seal? He did. Now, he didn't motivate evil. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, as these events take place, if God can't use it, he's not going to allow it. I don't know what all is taking place there, but I think one of the things is God's calling the Jewish people back to himself, giving them another chance to decide who Jesus Christ is, possibly. Well, if you'll bear with me for a little bit, uh, if you notice me shaking a little bit, they've diagnosed me with Parkinson's, and uh, sometimes I just shake. But uh, if the Lord will help us, we're going to try to glorify him this morning for a little while. Good to be with you all. We're going to look at the book of Colossians, and uh, in our family devotions, Actually, not devotions. We've been doing a by our phones Bible study, and we went through Colossians just here recently, and it kind of stood out to me, especially this first chapter of the book of Colossians. Colossians was written by Paul from jail in Rome, probably around 63 A.D., which would make it 30-some years after the crucifixion and resurrection and glorification of Jesus Christ. Um, we don't know that Paul ever met Jesus, actually, one-on-one, -on -one, but he did meet him one-on-one. <laughs> -on -one. We may talk about that a little bit more. Uh, but now Paul is in the last part of his life. He's in a Roman jail. And he was there for six, seven years probably, and he did a lot of writing. Um, last Sunday we were talking about this in Independence. There was a man that stood up and uh, he told the church, he said, I'm discouraged. And he told some things that had happened. Some one, I don't know how many of you know Steve, who Steve Stetler was knew who he was, a uh, gifted speaker to me, a uh, tremendous missionary. And that was one of the men he mentioned. He said, you know, he said, why did God allow him to be, him to die? Why did he do that? Well, I don't know. Um, I can't answer that question. But... As you think about the Apostle Paul, he went on all those three missionary journeys. The last one, he goes to Rome, and uh, he's there. You know, tradition says that he was preaching to the Praetorian Guard there in Caesar's palace, and it led many of those men to Christ, uh, writing those letters. One of the most severe uh, persecutions of that day was starting and had started actually Paul helped as Saul helped start the persecution of the church right back in Jerusalem and this persecution has spread now uh, to most of the world the Jewish people in the synagogues that had not uh, believed on Christ had hounded Paul and the Christians and created lots of, and so this persecution is going to go all the way to Rome. And it looked like that Paul's mission was to encourage the church by writing. We don't know that Paul ever went to Colossians or Colossae, the town, <clears throat> but Epaphras had come by and was talking to Paul about this church. Uh, you might remember that one of the churches that uh, John the Revelator wrote to was the church at Laodicea. And Colossae is just very, very close in distance to Laodicea. In fact, uh, he tells in, I think it's 
of chapter 4. He says, have this uh, letter also read in, Colo in Laodicea. Might be chapter 3. But anyway, uh, so they're very close in proximity. Um, Colossae was probably also one of the smallest churches that uh, Paul had ever written to. But because of some of the issues that were going on, he wanted to uh, reach out to this church. And um, I think it's important to note that the Apostle Paul had some authority that not everybody had. He was the Apostle born out of due season. So, <clears throat> there were problems in this church, and his answer to their problem was the glorified Christ. And uh, that's what we're, one of the things we're going to look at as we get into this chapter 1. I'm I think I'm just going to read this chapter to us, if you want to follow along. I'll be reading out of the King James. A lot of times in my own Bible study, I read the ESV, but uh, maybe the King James will sound a little more uh, traditional anyway. Verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. He's saying, it's by the will of God that I'm here. And Timo Timotheus, our brother, probably who is writing for him. To the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, of the love which you have to all the saints, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which is come unto you as it is in all the world, bringing forth fruit as it doth in you, since the day ye heard of it and knew the grace of God in truth. As ye learned of Epaphras, who was the missionary to them, our dear faithful fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. For this cause, we also, since the day we heard of it, do not cease to pray for you and desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual, in all wisdom and spiritual understanding that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all the might according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us unto the kingdom of his dear son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin. I might point out here that in, uh, in verse 8 he mentions the Spirit, in verse 12 he mentions the Father, and in this verse 13 we just read, he mentions the Son. Now what do we have there? We have all three. It's the Godhead. Okay. <clears throat> 14. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin. And then in these next few verses, this is, a, this is what we want to look at in a little more depth here in a minute a eulogy, and a description of who Jesus is. And I think, I think that we, all of us, if we're going to persevere in the world we're in, we're going to have to know who Jesus is, have to get a hold. Um, Sister... Uh, Dora 
talk to us about the vine and the branches abiding. That's a tremendous thought that we can be in Christ. And, uh, you know, I, I am not uh, looking forward to persecution. I don't know where persecution in America might go to. I wouldn't tell you that I have grace for that today. But I believe that Christ in us and us in Christ can help us be ready for whatever it needs to be and to be a help to others as we face these different situations. Verse 15, talking about the Son, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. That's pretty high status. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things are created by him and for him. So are you telling me, is he telling me here that the Republic of China That Christ is over that? How about even the United States? Are we saying he's over that? Do we believe that? Now, don't ask me to explain how he can be over it and allow some of the things that are going on because I can't answer all that. I'm, I'm not smart enough. But I'm telling you, as the seals are being popped and he is allowing things to happen, he is bringing what he wants into fruition. Um, we went through the book of Daniel just recently a, a little bit in Parsons Bible study. And uh, those Daniel and those three Hebrew boys, they come into the kingdom, marched in there probably on a, on a dirt road, maybe in shackles, to be a part of the Chaldean Empire. And this evil empire, uh, this wicked Nebuchadnezzar, he's got plans for these men, these boys. They're sharp. They're brilliant. They're intelligent. They were at the head of their class. And if from my study, if what, uh, what he had planned for them is true, he intended to take them and, and the best of the Jewish boys in, from captivity and retrain them to be true Chaldeans, teach them the language, the culture, the religion, the belief system, and take them right back to the area of Jerusalem and their country and help uh, remake that to Chaldean belief system. That's what he intended to do. Well, what happened? <laughs> By the time Nebuchadnezzar got to know Daniel and the three Hebrew boys a little better, he exalted the God of heaven. You think God can do that still? That in this chaos that we're in, that there might be people that think they have control, exalt the God of heaven, God help us that it would be so. Let's read that 16 again. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, and they be thrones, or whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he goes a step further. And he is before all things. And by him all things. And by him all things consist. That's a bold statement. But what, what Paul is saying to these people at Colossae. And what he's saying to us is... Uh, Mr. Biden is not in control. He's up there. 
the, the legislative group is not in control. They, can, they exist up there. They have their place because God allows them to have that place. If you go on to the story of Nebuchadnezzar, the next king that Daniel runs into is Belshazzar. Remember him? Belshazzar has a fancy feast and he uh, feels like he's on top of the world. And so in his arrogance and pride, he brings the temple cups and dishes out that, they had, that his grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar, had taken from the Jewish temple, brings them out. And they're showing their dominance and their, uh, and their arrogance by drinking wine from these holy, sacred cups that uh, had been put together back during Solomon, David's time. And uh, all of a sudden, the hand comes on the wall. And uh, nobody knows what to do. It terrifies this king because there's something out of this out of the spiritual world that he doesn't have control of on the wall anyway the upshot of it was Daniel comes in to tell him what's going to happen and Daniel makes a quite a statement that kind of parallels some of this language right here he says Belshazzar you knew how God dealt with your grandfather Nebuchadnezzar how he talked to him how he'd shown his power and you've ignored it the kingdom is going to be taken from you tonight and he makes a statement there if you go back and read it the God in whose hand thy breath is that's the one that's driving the hand on the wall Folks, let's be on the right side of what's coming. You want to be on the right side of what's coming? It appears that uh, we're in the minority right now. If you believe in Jesus, if you believe in being saved, if you believe in being a Christian, if you believe in traditional family values, if you believe in some of those things, um, uh, My, I don't, I don't pay much attention to Facebook. Once in a while, Vashti will tell me something's going on, and I'll say, "Well, let me look at that," or I'll, you know, especially missionaries or some of the kids. But some of the stuff breaks my heart that you see. It really does. And family members the other day, she's saying, one of our, one of our family members was in relationship. Uh, a girl was in relationship with another girl. And, uh, you know, uh, if you don't believe all this stuff, <laughs> you're in the past. You're archaic. You're out of date. This world and all of the uh, oxygen we breathe, all of the resources of this world, the love and joy that's in this world, are all because of Jesus Christ and who he is. That stuff isn't going to hell. None of it. So by him all things consist. He is the head of the body. In, in uh, the book of Ephesians, Paul addresses that we're the body and we need to work together some of those things, but in this he emphasizes that Jesus Christ is the head of the body, the church. Who is the beginning, the firstborn, from the dead, and in all things that in all things he might have the preeminence. So, by right of conquest or conquering death, Jesus Christ has the preeminence over everything. Verse 19, for it pleased the Father that in him should all the fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, 
By him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And this comes to you and I, that you who were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight, if you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard, which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made minister. And then Paul talks a little bit about uh, what's going on with him. Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body, which is the church, whereof I am made a minister according to the dispens dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Even the mystery which has been hid from the ages and generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this ministry among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect, in Christ Jesus, whereunto I also labor, striving according to the, his workings, which worketh in me mightily. Tremendous uh, acknowledgement of who Jesus Christ is and what he did for that group and what he's still doing. One of the things that, um, that Paul was worried about with his church at Colossae was we can find in chapter 2, um, verse 8. Let's look at that just a minute. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Um, how many of you heard the word, the Gnostic gospel, heard that term? Heard of that? There was some of this probably being, uh, starting to be promoted at, um, at this church, to these people at Colossae. Also, when the gospel was being spread across Asia Minor, Asia Minor, where this church was, which is modern-day Turkey, as these things were being, uh, as as the gospel was being spread, the synagogues, the Jews, would come along behind and say, "Yes." Uh, you can be saved, you can, but you also need to follow the traditions of the Jewish church, the Jewish uh, way, which includes um, being circumcised. That was one of the big ones. So this was confusing. You know, somebody that's never been around church very much, and all of a sudden you're wanting to them to follow age-old traditions that, uh, you know, they don't even know what they mean, hardly. And uh, then there's also this message that everything in, comes to us that we need in following Christ. Well, I guarantee you, if you, uh, if you were circumcised as an adult male, that gets your attention. I won't go into any more details than that, but uh, that'd be a tremendous thing to deal with. And Paul knew, in fact, all of these uh, apostles knew that there was a real danger in that traditionalism taking over and supplanting the knowledge of Christ. Mentions uh, 
mentions, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy. This Gnosticism, I'll give you definitions of that, was the thought and practice especially of various cults in this area, pre-Christian and early Christian eras, distinguished by the conviction that matter is evil and that the free freedom of the soul comes through knowledge, secret knowledge. And uh, they call it esoteric knowledge, which means that uh, only the privileged got to know. One of the uh, most famous gospels, Gnostic gospels, is the Gospel of Thomas. And a few uh, decades ago, there in Egypt, there was a cave they found, kind of like the Dead Sea Scrolls. They found some of these ancient writings, 52 of them, in fact. Well, that all seems real kind of uh, meaningful, right? And yet Paul is warning them about getting caught up in this uh, vain philosophy and uh, getting sidetracked from true Christianity. And so I'd like to encourage us this morning, if we, uh, if we will stay rooted and grounded in the knowledge of who Jesus is, as we talked about in Sunday school, if we will abide in him, in the vine, and let him abide in us. Could I uh, say one more thing about that abiding if you read those verses, a lot of times he says the way you do it is you obey my word. You uh, come into knowledge of my word. And so what happens in chapters 5, 6, and 7 of Matthew? Remember what happened there? Sermon on the Mount. There are 40-some subjects that Jesus talks about in those three chapters. There's another section in Luke where he talks about some of the same things. But I think, you know, um, we come from a tradition of we're going to get the experience of salvation and the experience of holiness, right? Right? Some of you younger ones, I don't know of how much you've heard of that, but uh, have you had the experience is a popular phrase. Well, it is more than, we're having an experience right now. Part of it might be better than others, but <laughs> that's what we're doing. We're experiencing something right now. We have experiences all day long. But coming to the place and the knowledge of your sins forgiven and then walking in that knowledge coming to a place where the Spirit of Christ comes and infills us. That is an experience, but it's an ongoing thing. And if, you, if we once in a while will go back and read those three chapters, 5, 6, 7, and Matthew, and then figure out how to deal with everything that's in there, we will be in Christ. <laughs> I guarantee you. Some of it's not real easy to uh, get your head around it. When uh, he said, pick up that burden when that Roman soldier comes by and tells you to carry this for a mile, well, just go ahead and carry it another mile too. Does that sound easy to do? I don't, I'm not going to tell you exactly that how to do what you've got to do with all those words. Well, what I'm telling you is that's part of being in Christ. It's not just come down, get, get a, an experience of salvation, and it's once and done. It is a lifelong commitment of being in Christ. I'm going to quit. It's a little before noon. I know what you're used to, but uh, it is all about Jesus Christ, and I'm thankful for him. Brother Brandon, if I turn it back over to you. Did I get your name right? Okay.
thank you so much for that good message. I know we're all going to take it to heart. Let's think about it through the day. If there's nothing else, let's stand. We'll be dismissed. Pardon? Dinner over here at the fellowship hall. All right. D, would you dismiss us, please? Lord, in a quiet, deep, tender way. Thank you, Lord. You're dismissed.